So, hey everyone, welcome back to another interview inside the Peace Project. And today I am joined with um, double Olympian and also a family member to me, my brother in law, Ian Wynn. Welcome, Ian. Hi, Becky. No. <laughs> so, um, so, I've known you for a few years now because you're <laughs> you married to me. <laughs> but, um, but I brought you inside the Peace Project today because you have an incredible story. So I know that uh, you've, you've been uh, an athlete pretty much all your life. Uh, yeah, not so much recently, but in the <laughs> early years. And uh, uh, I first knew you through the swimming club, but you then actually went on to pursue a career in flat water canoeing, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Transferred from the warm swimming pool to the outside. And, uh, and you were pretty good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you went to the Sydney Olympics. You were yep. just out of the final there. Um, yep. So you put your nose back to the grindstone. You made a few diet changes. Um, yep. And you qualified and went to the Athens Olympics. Yep, yep, that's right. Um, and yeah, actually you, had, you were in two races, the K2 with Paul. K2000 metres with, with Paul, Darby Doman, yeah, and the K1 500 metres. Yeah, so um, so I was there. I was actually at um, out in Athens uh, with my sister and your parents. And uh, now if I remember correctly, you qualified directly into the K1 final. K1 meaning solo um, canoes. Yeah, kayak, kayak one is, is the kayak. K1, whereas the K2 means kayak for two people. Yeah. yeah, and um, I'm correct. You you um you made it straight to the final. You qualified straight to the final. Well, no, we so with the K1 because there's so many people racing it. Um, I had to go through the heat, the semi into okay. the final, and uh, I mean that was the, I guess the most stressful bit because in Sydney we did the heat and then the semi final, and I, three people from the semi final went to the final. I was number four, so you're not quite there. You don't get the chance to race. In the final um so in athens when i got through the semi-final i had a blistering semi-final actually won it by quite quite a margin and i was on absolute top form so getting into the final was like oh yes you know i've made it and this was a big deal athens for you because really you were getting to the sort of latter end of your career um you weren't really sort of planning on going for another four years so it was really sort of a I, um, and I remember that morning uh, and my sister was just like, she was just so on edge because it was, it was, it was the one, wasn't it? It was the race. Yeah, uh, completely. And I, I mean, I'd raced, so two days previously, I'd raced in the K2000 with Paul and that, that was my first ever Olympic final. We made the final in the K2 and we, we had a really close race. We finished seventh. We were, we were proud of that, but we were only... I think it was less than two seconds away from the medal. So like, you know, a fraction. And then it was time to regroup and focus on the K1. But this, yeah, in, in terms of, uh, you know, that solo journey, you know, which I've been on for 16 years. Mm -hmm. I first anticipated trying to go to the games. First declared I was going to go to the Olympic Games and I was, I was 12, you know, and uh, just looking ahead, it was like, wow, you know, that's, that's a long old journey. So this was the, the end point of that journey, really. Yeah. You're right. I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen beyond it. All I, all I, everything was working up to that finish line. I had no concept of what happened two meters after the finish line or five minutes afterwards. Yeah. And then, unbeknownst to us, there was a whole turn of events that happened the evening before that final. Do you want to talk us through what happened? Yeah. So. I'm sure people will be aware, but, you know, athletes are, we, we try and control as much as we can. We try and routine everything so that your preparation, all your steps are exactly in order. Um, so you, you can predict, I guess, as much as possible what's going to happen. Put yourself in the best possible place. You don't leave it to chance. But the night before um, my final, we did the normal routine. We go down to the food hall in the Olympic Village, which is this vast, tented area full of every Olympic athlete there, you know, trying to scoff themselves. Had the dinner, get on the bus to go back to our accommodation. And as I went to get off the bus, 
there was another British athlete on there and she was looking quite despondent. Um, she hadn't had the best of days and she had this huge, huge kit bag. It was one of the modern pentathletes. So being a gentleman, I just offered to carry a bag off the bus for her, you know, and help. So lifted this bag off. And as I'm stepping off the bus, I completely misjudged where the curve was. And I had this big, heavy bag on, on balancing me. And as I put my foot down, I missed the curb. My weight carried forward and I rolled over, ended up on the floor. And I was sitting there and I could see my ankle just swelling up in front of my eyes, getting bigger and bigger and redder and redder. And she just gracefully picks a bag up and wanders straight off, you know, <laughs> none the wise as to what's going on. And my coach steps off the bus behind me and just like, ah, what, what have you done? Um, and he runs off to go and find some medical help. And I'm just sitting there looking at my ankle thinking, oh, like, what do I do now? You know, and we're just waiting for the, for the help to come, which never actually turned up. I had to hobble around the corner to the British Olympic Association's medical center. And uh, it was sitting on the table and the doctor was poking at it as a, a nice scientific test of, is it broken? <laughs> sort of poking at it. He didn't really know. He wanted to send me into the heart of Athens or the hospital to get a, an x-ray. And this is say, I don't know, nine o'clock at night or something. I was like, there's no, there's no way. We could be there for hours and hours. So he just wrapped it up in a nice jacket, gave me some anti-inflammatories and some painkillers um, and, and sort of sent me off and sort of strapped it up. Whereas, uh, and I guess that was it. You know, this is 12 hours before my Olympic final and all of a sudden my ankle is, well, for, as far as we knew, it could have been broken, it could have been strained. We just had no idea what was going on. Um, I guess for a bit of context, anyone who doesn't know, when you're, when you're canoeing in the sprint in a boat, every single paddle stroke you take, you're trying to put as much leverage for your body as possible. So your, your feet are pushing against a, a solid fixed bar. And I, I, when I'm racing, I'm probably paddling at sort of two, two and a half strokes a second. So every single time you're pushing with your legs. So the idea of, uh, of racing with a broken ankle was um, challenging. <laughs> so obviously you're in this situation, sprained ankle might be broken 12 hours before your race what did you do well, the first thing i did was i lied to my wife so <laughs> Lin Lindsay actually she she texted me whilst i was with the doctor and just wishing me good luck for tomorrow is everything all okay you know just the normal sort of pre pre-night sort of uh conversation i just text back yeah all fine see you tomorrow because i, I knew that if i said there was a problem everybody on the British sort of side is Lindsay and my parents and yourself would have just been like so nervous not knowing what's going on because you have no control you know at least I had some sense of what was going on um but then second one was basically try and get some rest you know just just try for that night and I I went to bed I couldn't sleep at all um I was in just so much pain all night the leg was just throbbing the next morning uh, we got up, we had our, our routine of going to the regatta course sort of a couple of hours ahead of, of the race. I didn't go and have any breakfast because there's no way I was going back to that food hall just in case I did the other ankle. Our, our physio had strapped it up in this nice bright pink bandage, given me a couple of crutches and I'm just hobbling around. Now normally, like I said, we're, we're very organized and we go out with a set routine and I couldn't go in my boat for the normal warm-up paddle because I couldn't physically get my ankle in the right angle. So the coach and the physio were trying to get sort of the setup right. So I didn't do a pre-race warm-up. I'm hobbling around on crutches and I saw several of the other coaches from my competitors talking to my coach. And they said, is this some sort of trick? Is he, is he trying to mess with our minds? Like, what is this? Because I'm going into it thinking I was one of the favorites beforehand the day before. And Eric was like, no, no, he's proper messed up. And you can see them walking away going, yes, you know, there's an opportunity there. And um, so then I got in the boat, just paddled straight up to the start, no warm up, no prep, nothing, couldn't do it. Just trying to get used to paddling with this really restricted, painful leg. And just every stroke you're taking is a shooting pain coming up your leg. And I guess I had to, I couldn't sleep the night before. So I had to, I had to just sort of get my head around what I was doing. Like, you know, my, my opportunity for an Olympic medal was gone. It was, it was just not going to happen now. You, you train four years, every single moment, what you do 
counts for like a fraction of a, a second in the race. And uh, and for a, it was only a split second, really. I was I was disappointed that my journey was over, and then I had to remember why I was there in the first place. And my journey from when I was right back when I was this little kid was not to go and win a medal. It was to go and be at the Olympics, to face the challenge of the journey. The, the end result you have no control over. So really, it's reminding myself that I was there to overcome a challenge. And what bigger challenge was there than trying to race with a broken ankle? So that became my focus. I couldn't focus on the race. I couldn't focus on trying to win a medal. It had to be like, I'm just going to go and do what I can and just see what happens. And I remember paddling into the start line and I had the guy on this side of me who was a three-time world champion. The other guy was a, was a world champion. He was a medalist. This guy was the Olympic medalist in a thousand meters the day before. This guy was a medalist. Everyone in this race is amazing. And I remember thinking, wow, this is going to be a great race to watch. Imagine they're just going to paddle away from me and I'm just going to limp down the course. And, uh, and the gun goes and your training sort of takes over and you just have to sort of go for it. So I'm going to stop you there because we have some video footage of your race, don't we? Okay. Yeah. So let's give it a go, see if we can get the technology to work. Um, let's have a look. So. Let me know if you can see this. We got a screen coming. There we go. Screen share. Okay, so you can see a YouTube yep. screen. Right. Okay. So, so we're going to play this. Yeah, no, I'll talk to you. Who in windy conditions four years ago in Sydney was only fourth. Then fourth from the bottom of your picture from, for Great Britain is Ian Wynn with that strapped ankle. And then just beyond him, Eric Veras Larsen of Norway, the winner over 1,000 metres and a bronze medal in the K2 just 24 hours ago. The improving Canadian, Adam van Koberden in lane six, stretching further away. Lutz Altepost for Germany in seven. Javi Correa of Argentina in eight and on the top Andrea Fashin and away they go and this is a real difficult morning for Ian Wynn. Yeah that's right it's going to be a real test for him that was a real blow for the whole British team he's the only man in the British team in finals today but he's got off to a reasonable start Nathan Bagley absolutely flown out of the blocks look at the determination on his face his paddles flying there he looks great. The important thing for Ian Wynn is to keep to his race plan. As you see, Nathan Bagley, two from the uh, bottom of your picture, going very quickly. And also Adam Van Kerbenden of uh, Canada flying out very quickly. And the Argentinian, Javier Correa, who's two from the top of the picture. They've got the lead, but now getting into his paddling rhythm, Akos uh, Vedekai of Hungary. Remember, this is only 500 metres. And at the moment, Ian Wynn now beginning to move a little bit, just about moving up into about third place now. Ian Wynn, Nathan Bagley, though, has stolen a march. Yeah, Nathan looks great. Head on shot in there, really rotating around the blade. But Ian Wynn's looking good here. He's pulled up to fourth place. He's right on Akos Ferrakai. I wonder if he can catch the Canadian. Ian Wynn paddling really good. He's got the rhythm now and the flow. And he's also got that extra little gear in the last 125 metres. And he's going to need it. Look at this. Absolutely terrific paddling by Nathan Bagley. But Ian Wynn coming. He's now got onto the stern of Van Coverton. He's half a length down on Bagley. Bagley, who was a bit fluy towards the beginning of the week, being challenged. Ian Wynn by Eric Larson. Eric Larson, who's last forever. Come on, Ian. Ian Wynn going for a medal. He's in just about bronze medal position. Now, Ian Wynn holding on, holding on, oh, it's on the photo. Oh, oh, that was close. I think he's got it on the lunge on the line. Let's hope he's got it with a strapped up ankle. He's taken the bronze medal for Britain. It doesn't get any easier. <laughs> so it was a photo finish. I remember yeah. being in the stands uh, with a, a ton of Brits um, screaming, absolutely screaming. To, to, to get you across that finish line, where yeah. did you eventually end up? So eventually, I mean, you could see there, we, we couldn't tell when we crossed the line. I, I knew I hadn't won because Adam was about half a length in front of us and he was giving it all of this. So we knew he'd won or either that was a complete idiot and he's making a fool of himself. But between me, Akos and, and Eric, I could have been anything from second to the fourth place. And it, it took a long time for the photo finish to come through and eventually, I finished in third place. I got a bronze medal. 
um and it, it was yeah it was mind-blowing really i mean i was i was i think it was eight hundredths of a second ahead of fourth place um mm -hmm. and maybe only four hundredths behind silver medal but um yeah it's quite quite remarkable really and uh the i guess the the final part of a long journey but um if i'd you know a few hours before that even minutes before that race the concept of winning a medal was just nowhere in my head um nowhere at all and i don't know if you could on the commentary i was actually they get the commentary a little bit wrong but i was about two and a half seconds behind the leader at halfway and he said, oh, he just has to stick to his race plan. Well, my race plan was to be one second down at halfway because I knew I could pull one second back to the finish line. And then every stroke after halfway, the pain that was in my leg, it spread throughout my whole body. And I was like, yes, I recognize this sensation because this is what it feels like when you're racing, not the pain of just an injury. So that was almost comforting. And in my head, I had this mantra of every single stroke was just, just pull harder, one more stroke, just pull harder, one more stroke. That's all I was shouting to myself in my head. And so you cross the line, then you're not sure what happens. And it's like, <laughs> where was I? <laughs> where was I? And but thankfully, it was, uh, it was third place. It was bronze. And, yeah. and I remember you saying to me that, um, you know, knowing what you know now, Perhaps um, you said one of the things that you did is um, throughout the night when you couldn't sleep was that you visualized racing yeah. with lower limb in injury. It's one of the things you'd sort of prepared for. Yeah. And I remember you saying to me, knowing what you know now, you probably, you know, you would have visualized getting gold, even with an yeah. injury, you yeah. know. And I was really struck by that limitless mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And because uh, you know you grow over time and so you what you think is possible changes and I, i've always been a big believer in psychology and how the body and the mind are so integrated together but and how the body drives a lot of what we end up thinking but we can actually understand that we can interpret it how we want and we can drive back down into the body as well and i remember thinking the most outrageous thing i could visualize when i was injured was i could still just about scrape a bronze medal that, that was ludicrous, but I was reaching for it. Um, yeah, but you're right now, knowing what I know now, like how limited was that? I should have been visualizing just scraping the gold medal. You know, I put that, that limit on myself, but at the same point, it doesn't matter. You know, the, the journey was to overcome a huge challenge. That was the intention. And that's what freed me up to even try to get the medal. If I was just trying to get a medal, a physical objective at the end, I wouldn't have even been anywhere close to it because there's so many barriers in the way. So it's the perspective of what you look at something through. So almost don't limit yourself, but don't focus on one outcome, focus on the challenge, the bigger task. Mm -hmm. I think definitely that's what helped me get through it. And to the point that I was dismissive of the injury for days you know, mm -hmm. afterwards, I was really trying to play it down in any in interviews and all the rest of it, because I, I'd taken it away from being a limiting factor on me to get rid of this idea of having an injury. It was only really when I got home and it really started hurting that uh, I realized how bad it was. All mended now though. All mended now, yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, and I think it's just an incredible story. It's been a real honour to share that with people. And I hope that they have found it as inspiring as I've found it. Um, if you had one thing, one piece of advice to give to people, a sort of a take home, what would you, what would you say? Oh, blimey. Um, one bit of advice. I think, I think what I've realised over time is that perspective can be your superpower. You know, really you have the power to change your perspective or to see the situation you're in from any perspective you choose. And by changing that, you can really change the situation. So, yeah, I think it, it might, it sounds simpler than it is to actually do in the moment, but you, you do have that. And if you can change your perspective, you can change what's going on around you and change how you interact with it. And I think as well, you touched on a really important point. You are very strong on psychology and mm. Um, and I remember, I think uh, Lindsay said to me once that, you know, you didn't consider yourself physically the best athlete out there, but you consider yourself to be very mentally strong and, uh, and look where it got you.
Yeah, completely. You, I could never compete with some of those guys on physicality. And I mean, often when I've been talking with, with other athletes over the years, I ask them the question, you know, who, who do you think is going to win the race, you know, in the final? And they all say, oh, whoever wants it the most. It's like, no, everybody in the Olympic final wants to win the final. You know, they're there. They're all incredible athletes. It's the one who believes the most. It's the one who has the most confidence in what they've done. And that confidence has to come from your processes, everything you do. It is your headspace. It's how you look at yourself. Um, and you have an opportunity to develop that confidence and look for opportunities to reinforce it over time and, and believe. And it doesn't mean you're not going to have doubts. Everybody on that start line has doubts. Everybody in the middle of the race has doubts because, yeah, it took, what, a minute and 40 seconds to get down there. That's a long time to be, you know, considering, am I doing all right? Well, how are they? Where are they? But it's having a, it's having a, a psychological um, process to help control those doubts and to give you the edge over, the, over your opposition. Mm -hmm. We could talk all day. It's such a good, yeah. topic, and I know you know so much about this, but um, yeah. I think it's it's good time to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time um, and sharing your piles of wisdom with us. And uh, I hope that everyone's in, enjoyed today's um, Peace Project interview. I hope so too. Catch Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.